Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I would like to thank also the organizers for the invitation and you all for being here. It's a great honor and great pleasure for me to be here today with you to share with you a, a story about our oceans, their importance for us humans, and also their vulnerability to human-made climate change. But before I go into the core of the subject, I would like to start with a picture. This is the first uh, complete photograph of Earth. It's called the Blue Marble. And it was taken by the Apollo crew in 1972. It's probably the most reproduced uh, photograph in history. And what comes to my mind when I see this picture is a quote by a famous uh, science fiction uh, writer, Sir Arthur Clarke, who once said, how inappropriate to call this uh, planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean. And the reason is ocean covers more than 70% of the surface of the planet. 40% of the world's population lives very close to the coast and half of the oxygen that we breathe is coming from the ocean. And the ocean provides a myriad of other uh, key uh, services to humans, from food to jobs, to economy, uh, to recreation, uh, fisheries, and so on. And there is one important role it plays also uh, uh, in climate moderation and climate regulation, which has been uh, critical to our survival and to the survival of many other species on Earth. And it does so uh, through different types of mechanisms. And one of the main mechanisms uh, uh, involves heat redistribution between the tropics and the high latitudes. As you probably all know, uh, the distribution of uh, solar radiation reaching the surface of Earth is uneven with the tropics receiving much more energy per unit of area than the, the high latitudes and the polar regions. And this leads to an imbalance of heat between the tropics and the polar regions. And together with the atmosphere, the ocean acts to uh, minimize and reduce this imbalance by redistributing the heat from the tropics to the polar regions. And it does so thanks to a large-scale ocean circulation system that is referred to sometimes as the global conveyor belt, which acts like a giant heat pump, uh, uh, transporting heat from regions where there is a nexus of heat to regions with a deficit. And uh, sorry, I would like to show you here an animation that illustrates this large-scale uh, oceanic circulation known as the global conveyor belt. This is an animation produced by NASA and it shows the, the circulation at the ocean surface going from the tropics transporting warm water here in the, in the Atlantic Ocean to the North Atlantic where the water gets cold, it becomes denser and it sinks to the deeper uh, part of the ocean and it returns as a deep current from the North Atlantic back to uh, the tropical regions, the tropical Atlantic, and all the way uh, to the southern uh, hemisphere and to the southern ocean. And then it uh, eventually circulates around the Antarctica. And some of this water returns to the surface because of uh, some what we call upwelling currents that are driven, vertical currents driven by winds. And uh, another fraction continues its journey uh, into the Indian and Pacific Ocean. To, so just to give you an idea, this global conveyor belt, it takes hundreds to thousands of years for this to complete a, a full circuit. So that gives you an idea about the, la the time scale involved uh, here in the ocean circulation, and it tells you uh, something about the potential the ocean has in controlling and modulating not only the short-term fluctuations in weather, but also the long-term uh, climate variability. But this is still very idealized and simplistic representation of the large-scale ocean circulation. Uh, in reality, 
the circulation looks much more uh, complex and much more dynamic. This is another animation produced by NASA that shows the ocean circulation at the surface. Uh, this is based on a model simulation. And you can see this uh, very rich panoply of different sorts of currents, uh, meanders. Uh, we have this uh, rotating vortices that we call eddies. And they populate the surface of the ocean, and they all act to mix water properties and redistribute heat and other materials across the globe. So these currents are uh, similar to rivers on land, but they are much stronger. And actually, to, to give you an idea, uh, if you look at this uh, current here, which uh, flows parallel to the coast of Somalia, is called the Somali current, this current alone can transport up to 20 to 30 times as much water as all rivers on land combined. And there is another mechanism uh, through which the ocean also can control and modulate the climate, which involves the CO2. And because the ocean exchanges carbon uh, with the atmosphere, and because of the longer time scales involved in the ocean circulation and its larger uh, uh, storage capacity, it has the ability to control or affect the amount of CO2 we have in the, in the atmosphere. And uh, as just uh, was mentioned by Francisco, there is a strong relationship between the amount of CO2 we have in the atmosphere and the global Earth uh, temperature. And critical to this uh, modulation is the role played by tiny organisms called phytoplankton, which are sort of microalgae. Uh, similar to plants on land, they also do photosynthesis. That means they fix CO2 and produce oxygen. But uh, 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 in contrast to plants on land, they move with the currents. So they drift with the currents. And uh, I would like to show you here uh, an animation uh, also pr produced by NASA. It shows the chlorophyll concentration estimated from satellites across the globe, both in, over on, on the land and in the ocean. So chlorophyll is an indicator of photosynthesis and of biomass in the ocean, phytoplankton biomass. And you can see that there is a lot of variability, both spatial variability as well as temporal variability uh, going on. You have regions, the blue areas here, with very little uh, chlorophyll. That means very uh, small phytoplankton populations and not much productivity going on. These are like deserts in the ocean. And you have other regions, uh, uh, high latitudes, the coastal regions, but also some tropical systems like here, the Arabian Sea, which has a very high productivity, is very active uh, in terms of biological productivity. And this has to do with the monsoon uh, system. The monsoon winds cause some vertical currents that bring deep water that is rich in nutrients to the surface. And this fuels uh, high productivity that we see uh, in the Arabian Sea. So, OK, so how does the biology affect the CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, so it works in the following way. The phytoplankton uh, takes up CO2 to, to, to build tissues and biomass. And some of this phytoplankton gets eaten by other plankton or other animals, and eventually gets respired back to the atmosphere. But there is another fraction of plankton uh, that after they die, they start sinking and they coagulate. They form large particles that sink fast, uh, like snow. It's actually called marine snow. And this brings uh, this organic carbon very quickly from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, where uh, they, 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 this organic matter gets decomposed by bacteria, uh, again back into inorganic form, into CO2. However, this happens at very deep layers in the ocean. And remember the time scales involved in the ocean circulation, they are very slow. So in a sense, the deep ocean is isolated from the atmosphere over time scales of tens to hundreds of years. 
So this process that transfers carbon from the surface ocean to the deep ocean is called biological pump of carbon. It is very important because it is a very efficient way of reducing the surface concentration of carbon and increasing the deep concentration, the, the concentration of carbon in the deep ocean. But as I said, this part of the ocean is isolated uh, over relatively long time scales from the atmosphere. And this way, uh, the atmospheric CO2 concentration can remain uh, relatively at low level. So without this biological pump of carbon operating, without the phytoplankton doing photosynthesis and sinking to the deep ocean, the atmospheric CO2 concentration could rise by up to 50% according to some estimates. And of course, that would lead to a much warmer climate. Okay, so far, I, ha I hope I have uh, convinced you of the role the ocean plays in modulating and regulating the climate. But what I have seen, uh, what I have shown so far, is the interaction between the ocean and climate in equilibrium. And we know that we are not in equilibrium anymore because of the global anthropogenic uh, CO2 perturbation. So here I would like to uh, illustrate this, the size or the scale of this perturbation with this uh, graph that shows, first the gray curve shows the atmospheric CO2 evolution from 1880 up to uh, now. And you have the, the bar plot that shows the global temperature anomalies with respect to the average temperature over the 20th century. So the, the red bars here indicate years with above average temperatures, and the blue bars indicate colder years, or years with below average temperatures. And you can see the gradual increase of the Earth's temperature with some acceleration over the last few decades, which follows very well the, the trend in CO2. Of course, there is more variability from year to year uh, in the air temperature. This has to do with the dynamics of the climate and the interaction with the ocean. Uh, but the long-term trend is similar to the evolution of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, now the question is, what role does the ocean play in this context? And the good news is uh, it's a positive uh, role in the sense that it mitigates the climate change perturbation, and it does so first by absorbing a large fraction of the additional warming uh, caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So here I show you the evolution of the total Earth's total heat content over time, over the last five decades or so. And the, the, the blue shaded area shows the fraction of that uh, additional warming that has gone into the ocean. Uh, the, 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 the red shaded area shows the part that goes uh, into the atmosphere, uh, land, and ice. And you can see that the vast majority of the, of the warming that was caused by the greenhouse gas emissions has actually ended up in the ocean. So actually more than 90% of the excess heat caused by the uh, human emissions of greenhouse uh, gases has been absorbed by, by the ocean. Without this effect, we would have a much stronger warming and climate change that, than what we observe today. Now, if you look at the rate of warming uh, from decade to decade, you can see some interesting patterns. So here again, the red curve shows the evolution of the atmospheric CO2 over the last five decades or so, from 1960. And here you have the global air temperature anomaly over that same period according to different data products. And below, you have the sea surface temperature anomaly again, based on different data products. And the last set of curves show the ocean heat content of evolution over the same period. Okay, so what you can see here is there is a lot of variability, interannual variability in the global air temperature. There is also variability, interdecadal variability. And in particular, you can see that the 80s and the 90s, the rate of warming was very strong. And then, by the end of the, uh, the 90s and the first decade of the current century, in this gray shaded area, 
the warming is very, has, has slowed down and there was very little additional warming actually over that period. And that has provoked some debate, uh, both among scientists who are trying to understand wh what is the cause of this, uh, as well as uh, climate skeptics who were arguing that uh, the fact that global warming has stopped uh, despite the CO2 uh, still increasing uh, just proves that the whole uh, global warming thing is not true, it's just a hoax, etc. But actually, it turned out that it was a, a temporary uh, uh, like a slowdown of the warming. So s over the last six or seven years, uh, warming rate has uh, accelerated again. And the other thing that I would like to draw your attention to, if you look at the, the ocean heat content evolution over that uh, period that is called, was called the uh, uh, warming hiatus period, and you compare it to the previous decades, you see that the warming rate has accelerated for the ocean, actually. So in other words, we didn't have much additional warming over this first decade because the ocean has uh, taken up much more heat than uh, before. So the ocean cannot, uh, does not only mitigate the long-term uh, climate change, but also the variability, the, the decadal variability uh, in the climate system. Uh, there is another way how the ocean mitigates the, the anthropogenic perturbation, which is by taking up some of the CO2 that is emitted into the atmosphere because of human activity. And in this diagram that looks a little bit complicated, it shows our current understanding of the carbon cycle. And the different uh, uh, fluxes you see here represent the exchanges between the ocean, the atmosphere, and the land biosphere. You see that some uh, fluxes or arrows are in black. Those correspond to the so-called natural carbon cycle. This is the situation before the industrial period. And you have fluxes in red that correspond to the anthropogenic CO2 perturbation. So there is a lot of information here, but I would like to draw your attention to two particular details. First, the carbon uh, reservoir size in the atmosphere in comparison to the ocean. So if you compare these two numbers, the ocean has 50 to 60 times more carbon than the atmosphere. So that tells you something about the storage capacity, the huge storage capacity of the ocean, and also the buffering capacity the ocean has to resist any perturbation we introduce in the atmosphere. Uh, the second uh, observation, if you look at uh, the emissions uh, or, or of CO2 associated with fossil fuel burning. By the way, the units here are a petagram of carbon. So one petagram of carbon is uh, one uh, billion tons of, of carbon. And if you compare this number, this is 6.4 petagram of carbon per year. If you compare it to the amount of carbon that is absorbed by the ocean, which is the difference between these two fluxes, which is 2.2, it's about 30%. So about one third of the emissions of CO2 associated with fossil fuel burning are absorbed every year by the ocean. So that's a big number and it's quite significant. So without, again, the oceanic uptake of CO2, the atmospheric CO2 concentration would be much higher and the climate also would be uh, warmer. Okay, so that looks like a, a, a positive role for climate, for mitigating the climate, but this comes with steep price for, for the ocean environment itself. And there are three, at least three major perturbations that the ocean today is facing and will be facing in future that all result from the CO2 emissions, uh, anthropogenic CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, which are the following. Uh, the ocean is warming, especially the upper ocean, as I will show. Uh, the ocean is losing oxygen, what we call deoxygenation, and the ocean is getting more acidic, uh, what we call uh, acidification. And I will start with the ocean warming, the first major perturbation. So here I show again the evolution of the ocean heat content as a function of time over the last five decades or so. Uh, but now I show this for different vertical layers of the ocean. Uh, 
And you can see that the upper ocean, especially the top 300 meters, has absorbed most of the warming. And actually below 2,000 meter, there is very little warming in that layer, uh, at least for now. But this is the global picture. Uh, if you look at uh, specific regions, uh, it's not always true. So here I show again the rate of warming as a function of depth. Uh, so this curve here shows the global, uh, uh, so the warming for the global ocean. So again, you see that the upper ocean uh, is where the most of the warming is happening. But if you look at specific regions, for instance, for the Southern Ocean, uh, this is the area below 55 degrees south, you see that there is very important warming uh, down to three, four, five thousand meters. This is the abyssal ocean. It's very deep. So now if we look uh, into the future, what the models uh, tell us is that this trend will continue and eventually will accelerate depending on the future uh, CO2 emissions. So here I show you the uh, model projections for the ocean heat content as a function of time. So this is the historical period. And uh, so here it starts the model. So you have the model projections following two different emission scenarios. So the red curve corresponds to the so-called RCP85 emission scenario, which is also referred to as business as usual emission scenario. It assumes that uh, we don't do much about curbing the emissions uh, or fixing the problem with climate change. And the other uh, emission scenarios called RCP 2.6, it's a strong mitigation emission scenario. Uh, one of the assumptions, for instance, is that uh, emissions will reach their peak around 2020 and they will start to decrease uh, right after. So 2020 is like in, uh, next year. So this looks like a very optimistic uh, scenario, at least for now. But you see that even for the strong mitigation uh, emission scenario, we still have some uh, further warming in comparison to the historical period in the future. Of course, the additional warming that we might get under the business as usual uh, emission scenario is much uh, stronger. Now, the ocean will not only uh, warm in a continuous fashion, there will be also an increase in the extreme events, and especially the so-called marine heat waves, which are similar to heat waves we may, might experience on land. These are uh, conditions where the temperature of the water crosses a certain threshold, and it stays over that uh, thre threshold for uh, an extended period. So these events uh, are projected to increase in both in terms of frequency and intensity in the future. And you see what the, what the models predict for the probability of these marine heat waves in the future. Again, uh, for the two different scenarios, you get different things. But even for the strong mitigation scenario, there is still an increase uh, although a bit uh, moderate in comparison to the other emission scenario, but there is still an important increase in the probability of these events. So events that are rare today uh, might become uh, very common in the future. So this, of course, has some serious impacts and implications for the ecosystems. One of the ecosystems that is uh, the most sensitive to the warming is the corals. And uh, here I show you an example showing the different coral bleaching event that were recorded up to 1998 and a decade later. And you can see an increase both in the frequency of those uh, bleaching events as well as in their uh, intensity or severity. So the severity is indicated by the red here, the severe bleaching events. Uh, however, corals are not the only system that might be impacted by ocean warming. Uh, one particular consequence of warming is that the colon water are, uh, in the ocean becomes more stable. Uh, that means that the surface layer and the layer uh, below, or the upper ocean and the, and the deeper ocean, or the deeper layers, they tend to mix less they are less prone to mix together. It becomes more or harder for them to mix. And that has some serious consequences. Uh, 
Uh, first one is that the deep uh, water masses that tend to be uh, rich in nutrients find it more difficult to reach the surface and to bring nutrients to the surface of the ocean where phytoplankton need them to grow. And that means a potential decrease, a decrease in biolog biological productivity. And what I show here are uh, some projections based on, a, on an ensemble of models. The upper uh, figure shows the change in surface nitrate concentration by the end of the century if we follow the business as usual emission scenario. And when you see the red colors means uh, a decrease in the nutrient concentration uh, at the surface because of this increase in stratification. Uh, the, the figure below shows the change, the projected change in uh, biological productivity uh, following the same emission scenario. So what you can see, there is a reduction in many places of the concentration of nutrients that results in a strong decline of biological productivity, especially in the tropical regions. And you can see, for instance, the North Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea, according to that study, is one of the regions where we might get a very strong decrease in biological productivity. So this reduction in the productivity of phytoplankton doesn't stop at the level of phytoplankton. So phytoplankton is at the base of the food chain, and this perturbation propagates all the way to the top of the food chain. And so here I show the change in the total animal bi biomass in the ocean. That includes all animals, uh, including fish, etc. According to two different emission scenarios, this is the strong mitigation scenario and the business as usual emission scenario. So you can see that in both, uh, under both scenarios, the, at least in the tropics, there is going to be some important decrease in the total animal biomass in the ocean. Of course, uh, the decrease will be much stronger under the business as usual uh, emission scenario. Uh, according to this study, my reach up to 50%, which is huge. And this, of course, includes fish and other animals. And of course, it has strong implications for uh, fisheries and fish resources. So now I would like to move on to the next major perturbation, which is ocean deoxygenation or uh, the oxygen loss by the ocean. So this is a direct result of ocean, war uh, sorry, of ocean warming. And it results from two uh, main mechanisms. Uh, first mechanism has to do with the increase in stratification that I mentioned before. So as the water column uh, in the ocean becomes more stable, there is less a mixing between the upper and the, the upper and the lower uh, or deeper layers. That means that the, 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 the surface ocean, which tends to be uh, very rich in oxygen because it is in direct contact with the atmosphere and also because there is photosynthesis happening there, doesn't mix with the deeper, the deeper layers where oxygen is uh, uh, less abundant. So that leads to uh, a net uh, or a, a, a novel decline in the total oxygen content of the ocean. The other effect is called the solubility effect, is simply uh, the fact that uh, warmer uh, water holds less uh, oxygen, or in other words, the solubility of oxygen decreases with the temperature. So these two effects together uh, cause a drop in the total oxygen content of the ocean. And this is something that we have started to observe already. So here I show you the total oxygen content based on observations over the last five decades or so in different vertical layers. And on the right, I show the ocean heat content in the same layers over the same period. And you can see that there is a resemblance and a symmetry between the two because these changes are simply the result of those changes. Now, the question is why is deoxygenation uh, problematic? So we have to look at the distribution of oxygen uh, in the ocean at depth, not at the surface, because the surface ocean has plenty of oxygen because it's in, it's in direct contact with the atmosphere. And as I said, there is also photosynth photosynthesis happening there. However, if you go a little bit deeper, this is the oxygen distribution at 400 meters, 
you can see some interesting features. So in the high latitudes, especially in the North Atlantic, there is a lot of oxygen even at that depth. But in the tropics, and especially in the equatorial Pacific, uh, uh, tropical Atlantic, and the northern Indian Ocean, there are regions with very low oxygen concentrations that we call oxygen minimum zones or oxygen deficient zones. And by the way, the Arabian Sea here hosts one of the most intense and uh, actually the world's thickest oxygen deficient zone is located here, not far from, from where we are. Okay, so what causes these oxygen deficient zones and why are they important? So as I said before, the organic matter that is produced here uh, by photosynthesis, eventually some of this organic matter sinks uh, to deeper ocean where it gets decomposed by bacteria. And this process, uh, which is called respiration, is the opposite of photosynthesis. It consumes oxygen and produces CO2. So if there is not enough uh, replenishment of oxygen that is lost or consumed by this uh, organic matter decomposition because of a weak uh, uh, mechanical ventilation of the ocean, you can have the formation of uh, low oxygen water uh, bodies that are known as oxygen deficient zones at depth. Uh, now the question is why uh, are they important? Uh, at least for two reasons. First, they define uh, like habitat of many species because uh, most large or, uh, organisms or animals in the ocean, including fish, they don't t tolerate very low oxygen concentration. So they have certain threshold of oxygen concentration. They cannot t uh, tolerate to go below that, the, uh, those thresholds. So they usually will avoid going into oxygen deficient zones. And that way, this uh, oxygen deficient zone uh, define the limits or the boundary of their uh, potential habitat. Uh, another consequence is that at the core of the oxygen deficient zone, there is barely any oxygen left, and organic matter decomposition cannot use oxygen anymore. So bacteria use nitrate as an alternate uh, oxidant in a process known as denitrification. This process consumes nitrate. And remember, nitrate is a very important limiting nutrient for biological productivity. And denitrification, what it does, it depletes the total reservoir of nitrate that is present in the ocean. So that has some implications eventually for this biological pump of carbon that I have presented before. Another consequence of denitrification is a byproduct of the chemical reactions that are taking place in that process is uh, the N2O, uh, nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas that is produced and eventually can escape into the atmosphere and increase the greenhouse uh, effect. Okay, now, uh, what does ocean deoxygenation mean for oxygen deficient zones? Well, as you can guess, it means bigger and probably more intense oxygen deficient zones, and this is exactly what we observe. So here I show you oxygen profiles as a function of time over the last five decades or so, taken from different locations in the, in the Pacific Ocean as well as in the Atlantic Ocean. And the blue area that you, sh sh you see here correspond to very low oxygen uh, waters. This is the oxygen deficient layer. And you can see that over time, this layer becomes thicker. Uh, at the same time, if you look in other places, you can see also that the core of the oxygen deficient zone becomes more intense. So there is an an expansion and intensification of those oxygen deficient zones as a consequence of ocean deoxygenation. Okay, what does this mean in terms of the implications? So uh, an expansion of the oxygen deficient zone means potentially a compression of uh, marine habitats for several species that are intolerant to very low oxygen concentration. That means potentially an increase in the predation pressure as well as in the fishing pressure that these uh, animals might experience. 
Another potential consequence is uh, as the oxygen deficient zones become more intense, denitrification might increase. And remember, denitrification depletes the ocean of uh, nitrate, which is extremely important for the biological productivity and the biological pump of carbon. And also, there is a potential for an increase of the production of N2O, again, very strong and potent greenhouse gas. So now I would like to move on to the uh, third major perturbation that is uh, directly uh, uh, resulting from our emissions of CO2 uh, into the atmosphere, which is ocean acidification. And I would like to show, to start with this graph that shows the, the evolution of CO2. This is based on observations from uh, the Mauna Loa station in Hawaii over the last five or six decades. This is the red curve. And here in green is the CO2 concentration in the ocean surface. This is from a nearby station, Station Aloha in the Pacific Ocean. And at the same station, the blue curve shows the pH uh, evolution over time. So you can see that as the atmospheric CO2 increases, so does the oceanic concentration of CO2. And at the same time, we have a decrease in pH. So, so far over the industrial period, the oceanic pH has dropped by nearly 0.1, which might look like a small perturbation, but it, actually you have to remember that the pH is defined on a log scale. So this is still a very important increase in the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen ion concentration uh, of about 30%. And we expect this to rise to up to 170% by the end of the century if we follow the emission, the business as usual emission scenario. Okay, now uh, why is that important? Uh, so if you look at the CO2, once it enters the ocean, it reacts with the water uh, to form a carbon species known as carbonic acid. Uh, H2CO3, and this drops the pH of the water, and also it reacts with another carbon uh, species known as carb carbonate ion, CO3 minus, to form another species, uh, biocarbonate uh, ion. Now, this carbonate ion is extremely important ingredient that is used by many organisms to uh, form calcium carbonate uh, that they need to form shells and skeletons and house structures, uh, according to this reaction. So what this ocean acidification does, it steals some of the carbonate that is needed for this uh, reaction, and it makes it harder for those organisms to produce and maintain their shells and uh, skeletons. So there have been several experiments done on specific species. This one was done on a, a small, uh, like it's called a sea snail, a small uh, animal in the ocean that is uh, used as a source of food for many uh, large animals. Uh, it's called the ter pteropod. And it was exposed to water with a pH that is similar to what we expect we will have by the end, at the end of the century under the business as usual emission scenario. It was exposed to that water over a period of 45 days. And you can see the shell of this organism, its evolution over time. You start to see already from 15 days and 30 days, the shell starts to dissolve. So there have been many other studies looking at the impact of ocean acidification on different species. And for some species and for some particular uh, physiological processes, there, is some, there could be some benefit because there is more CO2, so that it could lead to uh, 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 more photosynthesis. However, for the vast majority of species, and especially those that rely on forming and building hard structures with calcium carbonate, the, the impact is, is overwhelmingly uh, negative. 
Now, these three perturbations, they don't act independently. They are developing uh, simultaneously, and they tend to interact between each other. And from their interaction, we have some synergistic uh, effects, which means that the net, or the, the net of the three perturbations together can be larger than the sum of the individual uh, effects. And there have been many studies looking at these potential interactions. Uh, I won't go into uh, much detail about this. I, may, I can just uh, uh, maybe uh, mention one or two of these studies. For instance, uh, because of the warming of the ocean, we expect the metabolic rate of organisms to increase. And with this, we expect the oxygen demand to, to increase. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the ocean, uh, the oxygen concentration is expected to decrease. So that would make the oxygenation even more problematic for these organisms. Uh, another potential uh, interaction between acidification and deoxygenation. As a consequence of acidification, uh, it has been suggested that the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in the biomass of organisms, uh, of, of phytoplankton, can increase. And when they sink to the deep ocean where they get decomposed, this could lead to an increase in oxygen consumption during the, the decomposition. So again, this could amplify and increase the ocean deoxygenation. Now, the ocean will be impacted by these three uh, perturbations almost everywhere. But there are regions where that are particularly vulnerable to cumulative effects. Uh, from these three perturbations. And in particular, the tropical oceans, uh, because they host uh, these oxygen deficient zones, are more vulnerable to ocean deoxygenation. They are also more vulnerable to uh, the increase in stratification that reduced the biological productivity. And in the high latitudes regions, uh, the vulnerability to be higher uh, tend to be higher for ocean acidification because the concentration of carbonate is already quite low there in comparison with the low uh, latitudes. However, if you consider coastal upwelling systems like the ones uh, uh, along the eastern boundaries of the oceans, but also the coastal upwelling system we have in the Arabian Sea. Uh, in those systems, there is a su uh, supply of deep water, uh, uh, of water from the deep ocean to the surface ocean, and this water tends to have a relatively low pH. So these regions are also vulnerable to ocean acidification. So, uh, for instance, the Arabian Sea uh, is a region that could be a hotspot uh, of vulnerability for the three perturbations because it hosts one of the most intense oxygen deficient zones. It hosts one major upwelling system, so acidification could also be a problem there. And it's a tropical system that is very sensitive to the increase in stratification and potential reduction in biological productivity, which might result from that. And in the Arabian Sea, we actually have started to see early some uh, perturbations uh, happening. So here, uh, I show the sea surface temperature trend over that period from 1982 to 2010. This is based on satellite uh, uh, sea surface temperature. And you can see a very strong warming in the northern Arabian Sea, especially in the marginal seas, the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea over that period. Uh, we have also done some experiments where we tried to reconstruct the evolution of oxygen over that same period using a model. And what we found is a very important decline of oxygen, especially in the northern Arabian Sea, uh, precisely where we have this oxygen deficient zone. So that could also have some implications. So now I would like to uh, say a few words about the time scales of the ocean response to uh, anthropogenic perturbation. So if you take any natural system, uh, and you disturb it, uh, its uh, response does not necessarily have to develop over the same time scale as the time scale of the perturbation. And this is particularly true for the ocean, uh, 
where the ocean inertia uh, that has to do with the large uh, uh, water heat capacity as well as the slow time scales of uh, circulation in the ocean, because of that, there is a, a delay in the response of the ocean uh, to, to, to uh, anthropogenic perturbations. And this has both positive and negative sides. Uh, so the positive side is that it gives us some uh, window of time to prepare uh, adaptation and also try to uh, mitigate the uh, uh, climate perturbation. But at the same time, it makes some uh, changes quite irreversible on the time scale of uh, humans. So uh, for instance, it's like actually a speeding train. It doesn't stop uh, the moment you, you, you hit the brake. So whatever we do with the emissions, even if we stop all the emissions today, there will still be some additional warming, additional changes in the ocean because of this, uh, of this uh, inertia uh, in the system. So I come to the conclusions. I hope that I have convinced you that the uh, ocean is uh, warming, uh, losing oxygen, and getting more acidic. Uh, and these changes are likely to remain with us for some time, uh, no matter what we do about the emissions. But of course, our choices that we make today have the potential to either reduce the scale of these changes to something that we can adapt to, or to accelerate those changes and put us on a dangerous uh, path. And uh, before I finish, I would like to thank uh, New York University Abu Dhabi for founding our research. And I would like to thank all my colleagues from the Center of Prototype Climate Modeling for the great work they do. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you.